This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to Libya, where a brigade commander of Libyan revolutionary fighters says his forces are communicating with families stuck inside Muammar Gaddafi's besieged hometown, trying to secure a way out. More than one month after seizing Tripoli and ending Gaddafi's rule, revolutionary forces still face fierce resistance from Gaddafi loyalists in the towns of Sirte, Bani Walid, and in pockets in the country's desert south. Meanwhile, the National Transitional Council's delayed announcing expanded interim cabinet of up to 36 members that's supposed to be more representative, even as the fighting continues and questions remain over Libya's political future. Inside the recently liberated capital city of Tripoli, the mood's largely upbeat. Democracy Now! correspondent Anjali Khamet and Jackie Suwin were in Tripoli last week and filed this report. In the newly liberated streets of Tripoli, the celebrations continue. Months of violent struggle to reach the capital seem to have finally and decisively ended. But after 42 years under Gaddafi's tight control, how are people adjusting to their newfound freedom? We went to the heart of the battle for Tripoli, Muammar Gaddafi's compound, Bab al Azizia, a sprawling complex behind a maze of walls and fortifications. The outskirts still bear the traces of the battle that raged here for days bullet holes, blown out windows, munition boxes. Small groups of people sift through documents, including people's personal files that are scattered across the ground. In the center of the compound at Gaddafi's main residence, what he called the House of Resistance, we find thousands of people from Tripoli and across Libya who've come with their families to witness this piece of history firsthand. <laughs> We're standing inside Bab al Azizia. This was Gaddafi's compound. This is in the heart of Tripoli. This was the nerve center of Gaddafi's Libya. And today it's filled with revolutionaries and filled with tourists from across Libya. Really, I'm so happy. After 42 years, I never expected we would be free and in charge of our own destiny. <laughs> This was impossible, even in our dreams. What can I say? Thank God. This freedom was unthinkable for 42 years. Tripoli was besieged. We couldn't speak. Even so, we came out on February 20th, and we were so scared to be on camera. But thank God. It used to be impossible to get close to this building. It was heavily guarded, and you see how many walls there are. This was an incredibly fortified compound, impossible to get anywhere near where we're standing right now. And today, this place is full of people. And every inch of wall, every surface is covered with graffiti. Everyone wants to make their mark felt. I think every single person who come here has, who was in this space, in this palace, in this compound, has sort of signed their name, their family name, their town on here. Revolutionaries from Zawiya, revolutionaries from Misrata, revolutionaries from Sukha Juma, which is a working class suburb of uh, Tripoli. Right here in front of what remains of American munitions from Ronald Reagan's airstrikes in 1986 is where Gaddafi had erected a giant fist crushing an American fighter plane. It was from here that Gaddafi gave his now infamous speech eight months ago, saying he would hunt down the people rising up against him, street by street, house by house. Today, the remnants of Gaddafi's memorial to the American strike are scattered across the entrance to Bab al-Azizia, and victorious rebel graffiti now marks its walls. One man visiting Gaddafi's compound for the first time said it was a mistake to think that the people of Libya had simply acquiesced to the regime all these years. And we are very proud of the Libyan people. A lot of people in the whole world, in the whole world, they said, why you've been quiet for 42 years? I'll tell them now, we are not quiet for 42 years. We have tried so many times, so many times. The hallways of Bab al-Azizia are teeming with children. Like hundreds of others, Lutfia, a mother of three, brought her children to tour the premises. I can't describe how happy I am. Thank God for this freedom and the tyrant is gone. We used to live in fear. 
we didn't have the freedom to speak or enter Bab al-Azizia. This is something to remember. It's the biggest victory for Libyans and for future generations. Once a powerful symbol of Muammar Gaddafi's unshakable authority, Bab al-Azizia is now a monument to his defeat. In one part of the building, a sign hangs reading, this is where the rats lived, next to a hole in the wall leading down to a network of tunnels that stretches on for miles. People take turns walking down the dark staircase to glimpse what may have been Qaddafi's escape route from the city. Amidst the throng of families at the compound were also dozens of armed young men, all of them former fighters back for a visit. They received a hero's welcome with families crowding around them and posing for photographs. We spoke to one young fighter, Mustafa, age 20, who was part of a unit from the city of Misrata. He showed us how his unit had stormed Qaddafi's compound just weeks earlier. I'm from a brigade in Misrata. Mustafa explains that the compound was filled with Qaddafi snipers. About 200 people were killed by snipers that day. It was a massacre. They were all controlling positions here. We made our entry from that wall. Then, once we were in, we secured the gates. After eight hours of heavy fighting, the snipers retreated to the heart of the compound. No one can describe how it feels. You're knocking on Gaddafi's door in his own house. We used to be so scared. All Libyans know this. You couldn't even park your car or walk near these walls. And we entered this fortress entered his house and the tunnels he built. We found incredible weapons storage facilities. It's as if Gaddafi invested all of our wealth over 40 years in weapons. What can I tell you? God is great. Thank God. It's just indescribable. As we return to the main compound, we pass the ruins of one of the buildings flattened by NATO airstrikes earlier this year, a reminder of the many questions regarding international influence that looms in Libya's future. With battles against Qaddafi forces still raging in towns like Beni Walid, Sert and Sabha, and with Qaddafi himself still at large, the final fight for Libya and what it will become is far from over. Here, however, standing in his house, people are less concerned about Qaddafi's whereabouts as imagining for the first time their own futures without him. Freedom! Goodbye, Gaddafi. This is freedom. Take that, Gaddafi. I'm sitting in your house. For Democracy Now!, I'm Anjali Kamath with Jackie Suen. And that does it for today's broadcast. If you'd like a transcript or the video audio podcast of Democracy Now!, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. Happy birthday to Jessica Lee. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Aaron Mate, Nermeen Sheikh, Steve Martinez, Sam Alkoff, Hani Massoud, Robbie Karen, Ryan Devereaux, Dina Guzder, Manal Khan, Mike DeFlippo, Miguel Naguera, our engineer. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Julie Crosby, Nick Gella, Hugh Grant, Jessel Noor, Jessica Lee, Vesta Goddars. Tomorrow, Michael Moore on our broadcast for the hour. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks for joining us.